82 years ago, a man was away from home on business, and one evening he and one of his hosts went out for the night, had an activity that they joined in on, and they stayed out even past midnight. And once he arrived back at the room where he was lodging, he tried to sleep, but he couldn't. And one of the things that he did to pass the time was to write a letter to his family back home. And the contents of that letter were to, to journal through the day, as it were, and what all they experienced and how that had caused him to not be able to sleep. Let's pick up with the last few paragraphs of that letter. By now, we are on our way home saying very little. I now have found the key. I'm opening the door, now about to go to bed. But I'm not a bit sleepy. Now I'm musing, well, I'm a man and can forget all this and sleep soundly. But no, I'm rolling and turning and something is wrong. Maybe I'm too hot. I turn on the fan, but that's not the trouble. I'm tired, but not sleepy. Any guesses in your mind? Well, what has he done in the evening that preceded this time that's causing him to not be able to sleep? As I close my eyes, I can see but one thing, and that's that chair. What chair has he seen that now he cannot forget? The effort to sleep began about 1235. Now it is 2. I get up and read until 305 a.m., but no sleep will come. I can still see those boys when my eyes are closed. Now the chickens are crowing for day, and I pull the shades and slip away for about an hour. Then try and try to sleep, but I can't. I read, then start on this letter. Breakfast is over, and I feel all right, but I may get very sleepy today. And I know, without waiting to find the facts, that Brother Johnson did not sleep a wink. Pray for our dear children and for me. Let us be a model family and do a great work. God bless you, everyone. I must get ready to go to the radio station, then to dinner, to get back home as usual about 4 o'clock. I love each of you lots. Signed, Gus. Brother Gus Nichols preached at 6th Avenue for some 40 years. He's preaching a gospel meeting in Montgomery, August of 1938. And he and Brother Leonard Johnson, who began Faulkner University, attended at the Kilby Prison in Montgomery the execution of two boys. 17-year-old Willie Whitfield and 22-year-old Curtis Cobb. He returned back to his room. He could not sleep in the hours that followed. I guess it's obvious. But witnessing an execution is not a comfortable thing. It should not be comfortable to witness an execution. We turn to Scripture and we open the pages of Scripture and we witness and we see and we hear the most significant execution in all of history, do we ever grow comfortable with it? Shouldn't it be the case that our familiarity with Jesus' crucifixion draws us deeper into appreciation for that moment? We ever guilty of allowing our familiarity with it to drive us, though, instead to comfort and complacency. This morning, we're going to dive back in the text of Mark's account. And as we do, we're, we're again picturing this as Mark presents Jesus as the king, the Jewish king, who is the Son of God. And this morning, we'll look at two more aspects in addition to the two we studied last week. And we can kind of connect those two aspects with this singular thought that as king, as king, he has defeated our greatest enemy. As king, he has come in and has defeated our greatest enemy. That enemy is sin. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8, John would say, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of of the devil. The clause that precedes that statement, he says the devil's been sinning from the beginning. The works of the devil are manifest and seen in sin. And Jesus came to destroy those very works. 
And we see Jesus mistreated, and we see Jesus hung on the cross. We see a king who destroys the greatest enemy to all of mankind. This morning, we will look at these two aspects. How this crucifixion of Jesus was both inhumane, and it's also inescapable. And those are, are related to each other. It was done in a very brutal fashion. But it was also done very publicly. I hope we understand how significant that is. Because when we hear and when we pause to, to do research at, at what happened during crucifixion, we'll naturally wince. We'll naturally have some pushback and say, well, that was, that's terrible. And then here Jesus is the perfect Son of God suffering these things. We're, we're forced to, to wrestle with the brutality of that moment. But we're also forced to see it as something that happened very publicly. This did not happen at night. It happened in the morning. It happened during peak time there in Jerusalem in terms of the foot traffic, the people coming in from all over for Passover. It happened publicly. It did not happen in a dark room somewhere and, and details leaked later. Paul, you remember, would tell those Jewish, that Jewish king on trial in, in the book of Acts, this didn't happen in a corner. You know what I'm talking about. It happened publicly, it happened brutally, and that means we are forced to do something with it. We're forced to answer to it because it is so significant. When we see how brutal it is and how public it is, how undeniable it is as a fact, a moment of history, we're forced to wrestle with it. And we still ask the same question that we mentioned last week from the lips of Pilate. What shall I do with this Man, first this morning, let's look at the aspect of how he was treated. The treatment of the king, the treatment of Jesus. We must remember when we see all these ways that he, he was mistreated and treated inhumanely, he was treated as such as punishment for sin. For the moment, even before mankind had ever sinned, God told Adam and Eve, in the day that you eat or the day that you sin, you will surely die. So Paul would later say, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. How, how do we know that happened? It happened at the cross. He absorbed the punishment that every sin has ever demanded and deserved. Mark chapter 14, verse 65. This is a part of the Jewish trials before they turn him over to Pilate. These are the councilmen. Some began to spit on him, to cover his face, to strike him saying to him, prophesy. The guards received him with blows. It's already brutal. He's not even been turned over to the Romans yet, and it's already brutal. He's already being mistreated. He's already being mocked, being spat upon. After Pilate you know, interviews him and, and tries to figure out what's going on in chapter 15, he figures out, hey, he's not guilty of this crime. He's not worthy of death. You remember how verse 15 opens? So wishing to satisfy the crowd. Pilate released him, or he's for them, Barabbas, the one who was guilty of murder as a part of the insurrection he releases. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. There are just a couple of clauses at the end of that sentence. We see some incredible brutality, how he was mistreated. And this speaks to the public nature of what's going on because the most graphic, the most brutal words uh, describing what happened here, Mark just uses single words. And really, this is the case in all the gospel accounts. He communicated a lot to the first century audience by saying, having him scourged, delivering him to be crucified. Those were things a first century audience knew well. They knew what happened in scourging and with the crucifixion. So we have to rewind and, and do some digging and some research to figure out what exactly did Jesus undergo here as a part of this treatment. And you read other gospel accounts to kind of fill in the timeline. We learned that the scourging was, was not a part of the crucifixion process. Pilate had a different motive for it. Mark just kind of passes on through and says he, he had him scourged and then he let him be crucified. But we know that Pilate had hoped, hey, maybe I can, can kind of play both sides of this and I can appease them by having him scourged, but but really respect the law enough to not actually kill Jesus because he's not worthy of death. But it didn't work. 
And so Jesus was scourged and crucified. And scourging was a form of punishment that was intended to bring the victim close to the point of death. Take a leather whip that had multiple strands on it. And you can imagine that would be painful enough. They would expose the back of the person. They would whip their back. If it was just leather, it would be painful enough. It would leave those welts. But instead of just leaving it that way, they would tie bone and glass and metal at the ends of those leather strands. So it would leave the whelps, but then it would tear open the skin. And each blow was multiple blows because of those multiple strands and multiple pieces of debris. Tearing open the skin, maybe cutting down to the muscle, maybe cutting down to the bone in the middle of the back. And the Jews had the law up to 40 stripes. But the Romans didn't have that law. It was up to the soldier who was doing the beating to, to kind of read the body language and just see how close to death is this person coming. It was common that even though they did not intend to kill the person, they could die from blood loss, from shock, from infections that would set in. So Mark uses this word, having been scourged, and yet it communicates so much about his treatment and that he was suffering the punishment that sin deserves. Let's keep reading in the text. Look at verse 16. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion. Now that's another word for cohort. Cohort is a tenth of an entire legion. Legion was the largest grouping of Roman soldiers, about five to 6,000. A cohort was a tenth of that. You get the picture? They called all of the soldiers, five to 600 soldiers, to come look at this guy. This is a guy who's claiming to be king. Five to 600 soldiers, verse 17. And they clothed him in a purple cloak, purple the color of royalty, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. These are not rosebush thorns. The desert area there, probably one inch or two inch long thorns. They began to salute him, verse 18, hail, king of the Jews. Do you hear the mockery that's going on? They take the accusation that the Jews have brought about him, and, and knowing full well they don't believe that accusation, they use that accusation in a sarcastic way. If you're going to say you're the king of the Jews, now we don't believe it, but let's, let's take this and run with it and be sarcastic about it in order to inflict shame and humiliation upon you for declaring yourself king. Verse 19, and they were striking his head with a reed. What's on his head? Those long thorns, they beat him with a reed. What happens with those thorns? They go deeper into the skull. Those sensitive nerves, all those capillaries bursting and bleeding all down his face. And spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. There's more mockery. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak. What's going on? What all is going to happen there? He's been scourged. His back is bloody and it's scabbing over. It's clotting. They put the purple fabric on it. It's going to soak up the blood. And now they jerk that purple cloak off. What happens? And beyond that, he's now out in the open in his nakedness before they put on his own cloak around him, the text says, put his own clothes on him. And they let him out to crucify him. So as yet, he's still not lifted up on the cross and already had to endure this incredibly inhumane treatment. And once again, this is a fulfillment of what Jesus himself said would happen. In the third of those suffering texts of Mark chapters 8 through 10, he said, the Jews will hand me over or hand the Son of Man over to the Gentiles and they will mock him, spit on him, flog him. And kill him. And so now all but the killing is left to happen. Jews have had their say, the Romans have had their say, and now he's been turned over, the soldiers, for the act of crucifixion. When we think about the punishment he endured, the punishment of sin, it should make us uncomfortable. And a connected corollary to that should be that sin should make us uncomfortable. When we see what sin costs, we should never be comfortable with allowing sin in our own lives or in those around us. Just think how quick we are to just shrug off sin just because everybody does it. Just because every accountable person 
Every person who is able to comprehend the difference in right and wrong chooses wrong at some point. Does not mean it lessens, that it lessens its offensiveness and its despicableness to a perfect and holy God. Sin is still offensive despite its universal appeal. And we see a strong reminder of that when we see how Jesus mistreated for sin. Here is treated. Let's go now to his throne, though. He's mistreated on behalf of our sin, but he's also lifted up as king, remember? Chapter 15, verse 24. And they crucified him. You know, the other terms have been leading up to this. They led him away to be crucified. Now he's crucified. And they crucified him. It drops into place. The weight shifts. When they did, they divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. There the mockery continues because now they're gambling over his very clothes. And it was the third hour, 9 a.m. in Jewish time, when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. Here now we see it's public. It's inescapable. He's lifted up and they would have all seen it. The traffic coming in, coming out of the city would have seen this. There may have been this, this just attraction to a, a, an execution outside of the city and now they're all witnessing it happen. But make no mistake too, this continues the theme of brutality and torture. If all had happened to him had happened to him, it would be bad enough. If he was pierced in his hands and his feet but remained laying down there, it would be bad enough. The horrors of crucifixion really begin to set in when they're lifted up and gravity begins to work. When they're lifted up and they begin hanging on their own weight, they may be in a relaxed position and there's limited or less pain relatively, but there's no ability to breathe. The body is crunched down on itself and cannot get air, cannot get oxygen. There's a path to breathe though to use your weight and to push up on your feet and your arms to open up the chest cavity to be able to breathe but when that happens those nails maybe as big as railroad spikes have been placed with precision against the nerves and the wrists and the feet so all of that weight then shifts to those nerves the pain screams down the arms and up the legs so the person who's crucified is in a constant back and forth battle. I can have less pain but not breathe. Or I can breathe with excruciating pain. You know where the word excruciating comes from? The root of that word comes from crucifixion. Constantly back and forth, back and forth. And eventually, if allowed to stay there for long enough, the person would die from suffocation. That they could not handle that for long enough. And eventually they would stay in that relaxed position such that fluid would build up on their lungs. They would die from suffocation. You see, he's enthroned. He's lifted up. And it's there that he's seen before the whole world. But it's also there that the suffering and the torture takes on this palpable, palpable level of intensity. And he's helpless. It's embarrassing for the entirety of that experience. Naked or close to naked before all the world to see suffering this pain and the only release was death itself mark chapter 15 verse 33 when the sixth hour had come there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour so 12 noon to 3 p.m. at the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice Eli Eli lama sabachthani which means my God my God why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last he said truly this man was the son of God 
When Jesus breathes his last and dies, verse 37, notice there are two, quote, witnesses of sorts. We're trying to figure out how he's this king worth following. And now you have two verses, verse 38 and 39, which tell us and give testimony as to why we should follow him. In verse 38, the, quote, witness is that of the curtain. It's torn, and it's torn from top to bottom. With his death, something happens that gives us access now to God that man has never had before. You see it? The king has come in and delivered mankind to the presence of God in a way he's never been able to be before. Don't miss the implications of that as well. That while God has turned his back and has forsaken Jesus on the cross because of our sin, he still did not forsake us. When he tore that curtain, proved to us, you now have access. You've got a Jewish witness in verse 38, and then a Gentile witness, a Roman witness, verse 39, crying out, truly this man was different. He was no ordinary man. He's the son of God. So he's a king worth following. He's the king worth being a disciple of because, because he defeated the most dangerous and deadly of all enemies, the enemy of sin. Jesus does what no other king could have done. No king, no person ever been qualified to do what Jesus did. But had they ever been, never would have done what Jesus chose to do. Jesus did what no king could have done or what no king would have done given the power. And he fulfills prophecy after prophecy, not only of his own that we've mentioned already, but also from Psalm 22 that Tyler read for us this morning, some 1,000 years before Jesus when crucifixion wasn't even widespread practice. David's talking about piercing hands and feet. But also about 600 years prior to this time. Isaiah would write, chapter 52, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. You hear the treatment? He's high and lifted up and he's beaten and mistreated so much. There's even questions about his humanity. Verse 15, so he shall sprinkle many nations, not just the Jewish nation, but many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him for that which has not been told them, they see that which they have not heard, they understand. Chapter 53, this is verse 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. You hear the verbs? Pierced, crushed, brought us peace, healed. He was lifted up before all. Embarrassment, humiliation, shame that we all deserve why to bring us peace to heal us from how sin ravages our lives and destroys our souls this lifted up concept is something he talked about in John's gospel John would record a lot of this at least three times chapter 12 now is the judgment of this world now will the ruler of the world be cast out and I when I am lifted up from the earth will draw all people to myself. I'm lifted up from the earth before all so that all will see and know I am different king from all other kings and will know that I am the son of God who came to save all souls. As the king worth following, he suffered the mistreatment that our sin deserves. And he did it before all the world, for all the world, for you, for me, for our enemy for our neighbor, for our families. And this morning, the good news continues. It's a singular moment with everlasting consequences and benefits. Deliverance continues today. Its impact is not just a single day 2,000 years ago, but it continues. And the more we wrestle with temptation and sin every day, every hour, every minute, the more we, want, we must keep going back to the cross. Paul would spend a whole section of the text in the book of Romans, beginning in chapter 6 through the first half of chapter 8, to connect the dots between Jesus' sacrifice and us living free from sin. 
Several other verses that do that in a shorter context. Galatians 2 verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's no, it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ. Why? Because I was crucified with him and now he lives in me. 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in, this, in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. There's healing and then there's righteous living and they come through his suffering in the flesh. 1 Peter 4, even clearer to this end. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Remember Brother Gus's words? I can't close my eyes without seeing the chair. I can't close my eyes without seeing those boys in the chair. Peter says, I know you're suffering. I know you're struggling. But you have to remember that Jesus suffered in the flesh. And you must arm yourselves with that same way of thinking. Close your eyes and see the cross. Close your eyes, see the one hanging on the cross for your sin. Why? Well, why, why does this matter, Peter? For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. If we flip that, that clause at the beginning of, of that, or at the end of verse 1, actually, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, well, what does it tell us if we have not ceased from sin? There is still the need to suffer in the flesh with Christ, for Christ, like Christ. Discipline, self-control rooted first in the cross. We exchange our human passions instead for the passion and the desires of Jesus to fulfill the Father's will. We no longer have to live under the control of sin, but instead are are strengthened and empowered by his love for the will of God and his love for us, his passion, his desire for us. We see that at the cross. Our behavior daily gets to be rooted in how he was treated and how he was enthroned to deliver us from sin. This morning, if that's not a blessing you enjoy, let that change. Choose today Choose now as the time to come to him as king, king to whom you will give your life. Yes, it is the hardest decision we can ever make. And it is also the best decision we will ever make. To die to sin, to choose to live a life of repentance in him and to be buried in water, be immersed where he does forgive. And then when we're raised... The same power that raised him from the dead promises to lead us into a new life of righteousness following him. If you've wandered away from the shadow of the cross, sin has crept back in. You're no longer using the power that he has made available to overcome sin. You can come back to him. It does not have to stay that way. Please let no more time pass while you are still at odds and at distance with God. He died to close that gap. We as his church, as people, stand here ready to help you, to pray with you this morning, but also to walk with you each day forward. If you have those needs, 